Packers fans, welcome into the Green 19 podcast from JS Online and PackersNews.com. I'm Cassidy Hill, joined as always by Tom Silverstein and Ryan Wood. Uh, not together today, a little dispersed because this is a short week, so it kind of took our schedule and threw it into a blender, right guys? Uh, but the Packers are on a short week getting ready to welcome in uh, the Detroit Lions on Thursday night, which means not only do they have a short week, but they have a short week against an NFC North foe. And they have a short week against an NFC North foe that may be um, the toughest competition in this division. A spoon. I'm just going to start with you. A, an early, early matchup against the Detroit Lions being this tough. Could you have expected this a couple of years ago? And, and what's your general take on this game? Well, it's, um, yeah, times have changed that the Packers are underdogs at home uh, or anywhere in Wisconsin uh, to the Detroit Lions. It says a lot. I mean, they've lost three straight games to them. And, you know, one more loss would match the um, streak they had in 2017 and 18 when Aaron Rodgers missed three of the four games and they lost four in a row. So, I, you know, it's it's a different day. And I, I do think that the two teams are coming in this, about the same. You know, they're both banged up. Um, they both have very little time to prepare. And I think it's a good measure of where both teams stand at this point of the season. It doesn't mean where they're going to end, but it is a good measuring stick for where they are right now. Ryan, a good litmus test indeed. What do you expect to kind of find out about both of these teams? I think this game's a really good barometer for how legitimate the Packers' hopes are of rebuilding for 2023 instead of the future. And obviously, this is still this is the youngest team in the NFL. It's about the future, but they're two and one. They are one point away from being three and zero. They should be three and zero. Of course, you could make the opposite argument in saying that they should have lost to the Saints. So it, they've played well through three games, uh, better than I had anticipated for such a young team, especially at quarterback. Uh, But this going into week four here, this NFC North has really devolved into a a two clear cut favorites for the divisions, the Lions and the Packers, the Bears and the Vikings are still trying to win a game. So this is the barometer. If, if they're going to make noise in 2023, the Lions are the type of team that they need to be able to not just play with but beat. And I think it'll be very interesting to see just how legitimate those hopes are for this fall. Let's start um, at the top and work our way down then. And that's going to, of course, be with Jordan Love. Jordan Love is having to go up against Aiden Hutchinson, Brian Branch, a, a defense that is stingy, stingy, stingy. Uh, Spoon, I know you asked – Matt LaFleur about Brian Branch yesterday. This is only a rookie, but someone that can be an immediate game changer. He's someone that a lot of us thought the Packers might target in that first round. And then they, they go with Lucas Van Ness instead. Brian Branch drops just a little bit. Um, Could Brian Branch make the Packers regret giving him up by the end of Thursday night? Uh, He could. I mean, you know, he had a 50 yard interception return for a touchdown in the first game of his career against Kansas City. And so, uh, yeah, he could. Now, he, you know, he's also gotten deep for a game-winning touchdown against Seattle. So, uh, you know, it, it goes both ways. But it's, a, I think, what we're going to see is the measure of um, two really good rookie classes against one another. Um, you know, the Packers group has the second most – um, rookie offensive players have the second most yards from scrimmage in the NFL. And the group with the most is the Detroit Lions. So this is two really good uh, classes that are going against each other. And, um, you know, Branch is part of that too. And, and he has helped solidify their defense, you know, and they've been without their um, safeties. They're, they've been missing some guys in the secondary too. And he's been, um, able to help fill that void. When you when you look at Brian Branch, you know, the Packers defense, the glaring hole is safety. So that's why we were all kind of wondering, of course, the Packers didn't draft a safety 
that's why it's such a glaring hole. But this is a little different to me than TJ Watt versus Kevin King in 2017. Now we'll see how this plays out. We it's way too early to know what kind of player either will be. But back then in 2017, it was premier position edge rusher against premier position cornerback. If you're picking 13th overall, I think that you're erring on the side of, of wise to, to take a, a, an edge rusher over a safety, no matter how glaring the hole is at safety edge rushers win games in this league. And so if you're going to go for a project long-term and hope that the guy develops as a first round pick going edge rusher and Lucas Van Ness, it, it it's more practical than going 13th overall at safety. With that said, obviously Brian Branch has, has had a promising start and we have to see what kind of players these become. But I, I don't look at it as apples and apples much in the same way as 2017, maybe. I, I look at it very different. One's a premier position, one's not. Guys, Jordan Love has been sacked three times, which is tied for second least in the league amongst guys that have played all three games. So are the Lions. Jared Goff has only been sacked three times as well. Um, but you've got Aiden Hutchinson that is back there just eating up offensive lines even if he's not getting sacks he's getting into the backfield he has four quarterback hurries do the Packers have enough especially with possibly without David Bakhtiari and Elton Jenkins to keep Jordan Love clean again in this game Spoon uh, well the the Lions pass rush has been kind of up and down their first two games it wasn't very good and then they exploded for seven sacks um this weekend against Atlanta, against that horrible offensive line. As we saw, they can't pass block. They're very good run blockers, but they can't pass block. So uh, it's hard to say what their, you know, whether their pass rush is dominant. Eden Hutchinson is definitely dominant, and it will really help them if they could have David Bakhtiari there. Um, but, you know, that's that's not a given, and, and you know, you just assume that Rasheed Walker is going to start. Uh, every week until David Bakhtiari surprises you. But their pass rush, their their pass blocking has been very good, and it's going to be a good matchup. The Lions are probably better at home, um, you know, when they're, they're playing on turf and, and on their home field, and um, the Packers are probably better off at home because the noise isn't a factor. So uh, it, it is a good matchup, but through three games, the Packers' offensive line has been pretty good in pass blocking. Not so good in run blocking, but pretty good in pass blocking. Ryan, do you expect to see Matt LaFleur maybe move Jordan Love around and, and move the pocket some, you know, get him out on some boots just to maybe avoid Hutchinson, though? Yeah, maybe. You might have some rollouts opposite side of Aiden Hutchinson. Uh, and, you know, the other factor of that is, I think we're seeing Jordan Love become more comfortable by the week using his legs. I mean, it's very clear he wants to play from the pocket, but he has made plays both through extension and we saw the 24-yard scramble down the down the left sideline against the Saints that that are that's indicating that that he's he's just fine taking off using as athleticism when needed. This might be a week where he needs to do that. The most impressive part about Jordan Love only getting sacked three times. Is obviously that David Bakhtiari has only played one game. He hasn't played the last two games, which coming into the season, you, you might have thought would have spelled disaster. There's a reason why they gave him a $15 million uh, you know, guarantee this uh, this offseason to keep him on the roster and lock down the blind side. They, they felt like he, they needed him there, uh, and it's gone haywire if, in September. But Rasheed Walker's played pretty well as a seventh-round pick last year, and you know, it's just it, – it's going to be fascinating to see where this goes from here with David Bakhtiari's knee and and when, if, when he can get back on the field. Of course, having Aaron Jones back could make all the difference in the world as well. Um, we haven't got to see practice this week because it's been mostly walkthroughs and, and therefore the injury report itself has been estimations as well. But both Jones and Christian Watson have been "quote unquote" limited participants in these estimations. Spoon, do you expect them to both be back, possibly, especially given uh, Aaron Jones how he was working out before the game on Sunday, and just how much can Aaron Jones back? I'm, 
I feel like we're overstating this or maybe understating it or, 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 you know, I don't know if you can really put words to it. How much can having Aaron Jones back help this offense? Well, getting a, a fully healthy Aaron Jones would definitely help the Packers offense. But I don't know how much an Aaron Jones who's playing 15 snaps can help them. I don't know how many snaps he'd be able to play. I, I definitely think that Christian Watson's going to be under a snap count. And I'd be very surprised if he's able to have a big impact. I think, you know, his impact will be just his presence that, you know, the, the Lions will have to at least consider um, doubling him or, or making sure he doesn't get behind their defense. Uh, Jones, you know, it's just, it's really hard to say. He's, he's probably a little rusty and you know, going into the season opener, he was healthy and and ready to go. And then, you know, he pulls the hamstring. So he hasn't played in two, two and a half weeks or whatever it's been. And what is well, he's played like three quarters of football, I think. So I don't know what where he's going to be. I don't know if he'll be the guy he was when they opened up against Chicago. Right, if they are on a pitch count or a snap count, since we're not in baseball, if these two players are on a snap count, has the offense done enough through the first three games to to show that they could continue to probably, maybe, likely, or not find success without those two? I, I mean, how much longer can you keep this train running without those two on the field? I guess is really my question. I think Jordan Love has shown enough. He's shown that he can move the football through the air. He can make plays in a variety of ways. They don't have a running game without Aaron Jones. That's just the reality right now. So they they need it. And the thing with Aaron Jones, especially when they are struggling to run block up front, he's the type of back, and there's not a lot of them that can make something out of nothing. He, he's got the burst where he can outrun the defense, even in, in the box sometimes. That can can turn no minimal gains into something longer downfield. That that's that's a big value that they, they don't have anyone else in the roster that can do that. So he's he's the engine to the offense. As far as Christian Watson, I think that for for any fan thinking, oh Christian Watson's back, the deep ball's back, I'd caution against that. The one area that Jordan Love has not consistently hit yet is the deep ball. No matter how good your vertical speed is as a receiver, you got to have someone to accurately get it to you 30 yards downfield. And and I think it's going to take time between Jordan Love and Christian Watson, primarily because as with Christian Watson's been out, they haven't been getting a ton of reps. Uh, they've, they've got a, a lot of, of building to do with their deep ball chemistry. I think it'll come at some point. I just – I don't know it's going to be game one. That would be really impressive to see and a bit of a surprise. Uh, so Christian Watson long-term, as Spoon said, his – his presence on the field might help AJ Dillon. Uh, you know, it might, it might help to have the safeties back a little bit deeper and fewer players closer to the line of scrimmage. AJ Dillon could sure use that, but until Aaron, Aaron Jones returns and is playing full time, that that's when the running game is going to be back. And it seems like they've also been trying to hit that some with Luke Musgrave. I mean, I don't, he's not the threat that Christian Watson is, but you know, even though they haven't hit it necessarily, they've tried it enough times that I think at this point, when Luke Musgrave lines up in certain positions on the line, you've got to at least send somebody with him because law of probability says eventually one day they're going to hit one of these downfield to Luke Musgrave. And so, you know, maybe that's their, their answer. Just kind of try some of these other guys until Christian Watson is back just to force the defense to play a little honest. I mean, is that thinking too much into it? Well, I think anytime they're covering, they're playing a um, cover two type defense, they want Musgrave to run down the middle of the field and stress uh, the middle linebacker who generally has to cover them in that situation. So it, it kind of depends on what they're facing. When, when they're not facing a heavy dose of, you know, true cover two, then, uh, you know, he's going to probably make his hay on, you know, shorter routes. And the one thing we've 
not seen from him is ability to gain yards after the catch. He can definitely outrun some guys, and that'll that'll happen. But you'd also like to see him break some tackles and you know get off field, get up the field because most of his catches are going to be shorter in length. It's just kind of the way a tight end works in the NFL, especially the way Matt LaFleur uses them. You know, he needs them to block as well as uh, go out. He's not used like Travis Kelsey split out all the time. The thing with your deep passing game, too, is these, even if you're not connecting on it consistently, you got to keep going vertical. You, you got to keep doing it at this at this level because you got to keep the defense honest and by running deep routes, if, if if you don't have that as an element in your passing game, secondaries are going to uh, creep up in their coverage. They're, they're going to jam even more. They're going to play closer to the line of scrimmage. And one, one byproduct that I think that we have seen with them continuing to go deep or trying to go deep is that Jordan Love will take the check down. There's more, there's more space underneath available for Jordan Love if there is some semblance of a deep presence in the passing game. So – they're, they're going to keep going with it until it connects and it might not be chunk plays right away, but it'll help the offense overall as they continue attempting downfield. We have seen these guys, these young guys though, like Jaden Reed and Dante Van Wicks kind of really step up when a play has needed to be made and, and find a way to make it over the past couple of weeks. Um, Spoon, do you expect to see defenses maybe start trying to, to, you know, double Jade Reed or, or lock down some of those guys? Because obviously right now the focus is on Romeo Dobbs, understandably so. Do you expect to see more and more defenses try to shift their attention to Reed and Dontavian Wicks? Uh, no, no, I don't think so. I mean, Reed, you know, he had three drops in that game, which wasn't ideal, and and he did, did make some plays, but – I don't think he's a guy you have to double right now. I mean, Branch is going to be the guy who's covering him most of the game. And they're probably going to feel pretty confident about Brian Branch being able to cover Reed. So, no, and Wicks, you know, he's going to catch a couple balls on you, but nobody is is gashing defenses with that pass game. You know, they're making just enough plays to score. They're really good on third down. That's what's really been the hallmark of their deep offense so far, that and, and the red zone. I mean, they're one of the top-ranked red zone teams and one of the top-ranked third down teams. They're not gaining yards in big chunks, really, um, or, or just having these really impressive drives, but they are really clutch when it comes to third down and getting inside the 20. That's not a bad calling card to have to at least be good on third down and good inside the 20. I mean, I think most teams would take that every day of the week and twice on Sundays. Uh, and so, Ryan, with that being said, um, we t we looked this week at the the fact that the Packers didn't have Eric, A.J. Dillon, I'm sorry, on the field with four shots at the goal this past week. Coaches, understandably, when asked about it, sort of brushed it aside. Oh, that's just who was on the field at the time. Do you think that's just coach speak or, or do you think it actions speak louder than, word, than words and the fact that he wasn't on the field still says something? With that being said, also, how do you expect to see him used on Thursday night? Yes. <laughs> the bottom line is if you think A.J. Dillon's your best, your best option at the two-yard line, he's not on the sideline. He's on the field. And I understand Matt LaFleur saying that they were in a hurry-up mode at that point, but they also – no matter how fast you're trying to go, you're, you're prioritizing a touchdown and getting points. If he was your clear cut best option, then he's on the field at the two yard line. And he didn't even not even get the ball. He, he didn't see the field. So, you know, he's, he's running back two right now and he might even have some company on that line of the depth chart. It's clearly Aaron Jones. He, there's no one, a one B here in the backfield for the, for the Packers. It's Aaron Jones and then A.J. Dillon, Emmanuel Wilson some, and we'll see a Patrick Taylor. I, I, I don't know if he's getting – you know, he can't be elevated for game day. Rossa from the practice squad anymore. He's used his three. At some point, I imagine he'll be on the 53. We'll see if he factors into the offense, whether it's this week, later on in the season. 
But AJ Dillon's running back too, and and he's got some company. I'm glad you brought that up because I wanted to actually talk about this. We're we're recording this on Wednesday morning. If we're going with along with the you know a football week schedule, sometime this afternoon should be when we find out if there are any practice squad elevations for the Thursday game. Um, and Patrick Taylor is out of those. Spoon, do you expect him to be on the 53 by the time this game kicks off tomorrow night? I don't know. I don't know. It's a good question. I guess it, some of it depends on Aaron Jones' status, and some of it is what they need on special teams or feel confident. Um, you know, I don't know who they – would let go, but yeah, I think it's a possibility that they could put him on the 53. I'm sure that was their plan all along was that they would use, you know, ride out three games where they could keep someone extra on the roster. But now if they really do want to bring him up, you know, they got to figure out who they're going to let go. So that's, that's a big part of it. Who do you think they would let go? Well, boy, I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, they've got, I got some extra players at certain positions, but you know, you don't want to get rid of guys. I mean, they could put Zane Anderson on injured reserve, I suspect I suspect. You know, he pulled his hamstring. They could um possibly cut Jonathan Owens. Yeah. I, I think that's definitely a possibility. Um let me float this one too. Someone who hasn't seen the field yet, but they like, but could still be a project, Britton Cox. But it came back on practice squad. Yeah, it's a possibility. It's a possibility they could try it. You know, the the thing about it is that um, pass rushers are are what teams will take a chance on. What teams wouldn't take a chance on with Cox was that, you know, they thought his off the field problems were, they didn't want to mess around with that. Well, now that he's made it through a training camp and looks to be like a good citizen and all all the things that they call that, you know, Um, you know, maybe NFL teams would be more willing to take a chance on um, claiming him. So that's something they'd have to think about hard. I I don't think that Brenton Cox is is going to get released. uh, And I don't think this other player I'm about to mention is going to get released either, but if it came down to the two and and to be frank, I I think Spoon's idea potentially of, of Zane Anderson going on IR makes the most sense. But if, if they had to choose between the two, I would think Anthony Johnson Jr. Uh, would be mm-hmm. more likely than Brenton Cox. Uh, and I don't think they want to release Anthony Johnson Jr. He's actually a draft pick. Brenton Cox is not. But Anthony Johnson Jr. is a seventh-round pick. He's been inactive. He's not seeing the field. Um, I would – I would think it's much more likely they pluck someone out of safety than a developmental prospect at edge rush. Well, it sounds like it's going to probably be someone on defense because they're going to need everybody they can get on offense right now. Let's actually the, other, the other thing to consider is, you know, what, what to make of Luke Tenuta. You know, he, he's coming up on, on being eligible uh, to return from IR pretty soon too. And Derek Stokes. They're going to need a spot there. Eric Stokes, you're right. They're going to need a spot there. So it's not just one. I, there's there's a couple spots that they are probably looking at right now as far as what's, what's going to happen in, in clearing some space for the 53. Yeah. It's going to be interesting moves over the next couple of weeks here. You know, they could also cut Emmanuel Wilson. I mean, it, it's not like he is um, tore it up, you know, in his first games in. You know, I don't know that anybody running back is the easiest position to fill. And so I'm not sure that teams are going to be lining up to to take him. So that could be a possibility, too. Here, Here's a question right now. Who forget 53, forget practice squad. Who has more value to these Packers right now? Emmanuel Wilson or, or Patrick Taylor? Patrick Taylor. Patrick Taylor. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's- it. Yeah. Patrick Taylor is going to be on this 53 at some point, too. I mean, I don't know if it's going to be Thursday night. I don't know if it's going to be week four. But the same thing happened last year. He had three – he started on the practice squad, first three games. He was elevated to the active roster for game day from the practice squad, extinguished those three, and he played 14 games on the active roster. Patrick Taylor is going to be on this 53 at some point, probably soon. 
And, I, you know, if you flip that question around to who has more value to this team long term, mm-hmm. it might it might be Emmanuel Wilson. I don't know. Just from his, what we saw of his raw talent, can they do something there with it? But right now, definitely Patrick Taylor. Well, you essentially, know? you'd be flipping their roles. So now Emmanuel Wilson would be the guy you're – assuming he clears waivers, put him on the practice squad. He's the guy you're calling up for three weeks, you know, or mm. whenever you need him. So I I think that is – a logical move that they would make too. And uh, let me just, while we're in this conversation, let me just float this out here to see if y'all think it's something that could happen. Once he's healed, do you see Tyler Goodson getting put on this practice squad? I don't know. I don't know if they're done with him or if they um, want him back. I'm not really sure. Ryan, if you had to vote, do you think he's on this practice squad at some point this year? Maybe. I'm with Spoon. I don't know. I think a lot of it might depend on uh, potential injuries. Uh, yeah. You know, whether if Emmanuel Wilson or or Patrick Taylor are injured, and that's the nature of that position, guys at running back get injured, uh, I think it's a lot more likely. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think they liked uh, Tyler Goodson and – Boy, it was a really unfortunate timing of his injury because it looked like he was starting to go early yeah. in, in training camp. But I mean, we were having a lot of conversations about him being running back three. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and but there's the injury factor too. Do they yeah. think that you know he's a guy who um, will get injured a lot? I don't know. That could be that could play a factor in it too. Yeah. Um, well, we. We talked that subject to death out of nowhere. Let's flip to the other side of the ball here. The Packers defense is going to have to be going against an offense that, gosh, they're humming with Jared Goff. Now, you know, he he has full control of this offense, it feels like. Um, And and with Amon Ross St. Brown and Jamar Gibbs and Montgomery, I mean, Spoon, let me just pose this question to you off the tee. Pretty broad question here, but – what do you slow down first on this offense if you're the Packers defense? Oh, definitely the run game. I mean, that's number one. You gotta you gotta keep, you know, assuming Montgomery plays, um, he missed the last game. Uh, it sounded like um, he was going to play, uh, but he and and Jameer Gibbs are a nice combination, and so that's number one. Uh, you hope your pass rush can get after Jared Goff and cause problems. But the one thing you don't want is him um, running play action on you all day long. And that happens when you're running the ball really well. He's very good play action passer. So I think they have to stop the run first more than anything else. Much like the Packers, um, Jared Goff and this offensive line have allowed only three sacks this year. The Packers, though, have a pair of pass rushers that, or, or at least one especially, that has been getting home a lot more than the Lions. With Rashawn Gary, you know, he had three sacks last week. He has three and a half total on the season. Even when he's not getting to the quarterback, he's pulling double teams. He's allowing other guys to get there. Um, it, Ryan, does, does this Packers pass rush – do they meet their match on Thursday night against this Lions offensive line, or, or who wins that battle? That's going to be a hell of a matchup. I mean, that's going to be the matchup of the game because the Lions have one of the best offensive lines in the league. The Packers' interior run defense is, is pretty stout, and, and they can get nasty. The whole defensive front, obviously led by Rashawn Gary, getting after the passer. But this is a memo to every edge rusher in the Packers' defense. you got to set an edge this week. Because Jameer Gibbs, he's he's talented, 12th overall pick. Looked like he was starting to get going against Atlanta. He, he had 80 yards for, on 17 carries. And much like Bajon Robinson, it, it, he can stress the outside zone. Uh, he can really stress your perimeter. You don't set an edge on Jameer Gibbs. You won't give up a lot of yards. And we haven't really seen the Packers do that as a run defense yet. Even the Saints last week, they were – getting some success with they, – they had no business getting wide zone success in the run game with without Alvin Kamara, Jamal Williams. 
they, they had no business getting any success on the perimeter in, in the run offense, and they, they were. So this that, that to me is is the, the, the key to watch in, in this matchup is can they set an edge and can they keep Jameer Gibbs contained? Because if you funnel them back to your defensive line, they played pretty well. So that, that that's that's going to be really interesting to watch. As you said, the Saints had no business kind of being able to do that. But that's Joe Barry said this week he expects teams to do that until they prove they can stop it. Because as he said, you put something on tape that you can't defend well, which is exactly what they did in Atlanta. Teams are going to mimic it in this copycat league. Spoon Kingsley and Ibarre said yesterday, you know, that he knows that that Jamar Gibbs could be that guy this week that's going to try to test the Packers in that way, to Ryan's point, and that that it's going to be up to guys like him to Enigbare to kind of set that edge. Um if if he does get out and gets to that second level a little bit, um, you know, can this defense survive a week without Devondre Campbell possibly on the field? Because that's someone we haven't really talked about this week. You know, he left Sunday's game injured. Or do you do you trust is this let me rephrase the question. Quay Walker's speed and ability to get sideline to sideline, is this when you need him to sort of prove it? Yeah, I I think that's definitely uh, a factor, and I think he has been proving it. I think he's been very good through the first three games. You know, a lot of this depends on how healthy the Lions' offensive line is. You know, they Taylor Decker didn't play last week, and they had to move Panay uh, Sewell over to left tackle, and then they lost two right tackles. Two, you know, they were down to their fourth string right tackle. Not to mention they lost um, their right guard Vitai, uh, Vitai. So they were down um, two offensive linemen. They had, um, like I said, the fourth string guy at right tackle. And if if Decker can't play. You know, how are they going to block Rashawn Gary over on that side? I don't know. Uh, if Decker can play, that's that's huge for them. But they still got to block Kenny Clark in there. So they can blow, you know, if, if they can take advantage of who's not there or um, who's not 100%, if Taylor Decker's ankle is not quite up to snuff, um, they can blow up those plays. They just got to do it. They got to get their defensive linemen upfield and force that thing, you know, and let make sure that the contained guys are forcing everything inside. So that that'll be a um, something to watch for sure. Uh, let's go to a little bit farther out here. You've got Amon Ross St. Brown, who I, I don't have the stats right in front of me, but guys, it feels like whenever he's faced the Packers these past three games, he's he's been a problem. And he's going to continue to be a problem. Um, Jair Alexander was one of the guys on the injury report this week. He didn't play on Sunday. Uh, Carrington Valentine originally started in his place. He got hurt with a bicep tear. Uh, Corey Valentine had to come in. I expect that to be a practice squad elevation that we see later today. Just And, and that'll tell us a lot about what Jair Alexander might be able to do tomorrow. Um, with the Monroe St. Brown, is he – is he one of those guys where you just kind of have to start shifting your defense to him or is that putting too much on one guy, Ryan? If he plays, I think Jair Alexander, this is a week to match him. You can't, it's as good on good. And Amon St. Amon Ross St. Brown will absolutely eat you up in the secondary if, if you let him. So uh, it, it'll be tougher to do if he's not a hundred percent Jair Alexander, but, if, if he's good enough to play, you got to get him on Amon Ross St. Brown as much as possible. If he's not good enough to play, do you put Rasul Douglas on him? Do you let Keyshawn Nixon travel with him? Do you just put Corey Ballantyne out there and, and cross your fingers? I mean, who's your matchup? I, I think then it's by committee. You know, if Amon Ross St. Brown goes outside, it's Rasul Douglas in the slot, it's Keyshawn Nixon. Uh, and it's it's going to be wh where he lines up on the field. Uh, but th this is a really big week to have Jair Alexander. We don't know how severe 
the back injury is he was elevated on Tuesday from uh, projected not practicing Monday to limited Tuesday. Uh, if, and we don't know this, but if, if it was a matter of, okay, and I understand the saints have Chris Olave, but, you, you got this this important divisional game coming up against a really good receiver, Mon Ross St. Brown. Jair Alexander, if Jair, Jair Alexander was on the fence Sunday and just get him a little more healthy so he can take this matchup, it's probably a prudent choice on, on the training staff and, and the coaching staff. Uh, but this is a really important game for him to be on the field. Spoon, do you agree? Do you, do you save Jair Alexander for St. Brown versus Alave? Um, I. I'm not sure if I would match him because the way they use St. Brown, um, it, it would make things pretty difficult because they're going to run him out of the backfield. They're going to um, put him in motion constantly. Y you may be better off just playing it straight and letting the receivers come to whoever and, and having faith that Keyshawn Nixon can um, handle it. You know, the, the thing is, I, I thought that St. Brown had absolutely killed the Packers. Um, and he did in that game, I think his rookie year in 21, I think he had like eight catches and 109 yards. And then I looked at his other two games last year, and he didn't really um, destroy them. He didn't score a touchdown. And I think he had like 109 yards on 10 catches or something like that. So they have they've done a decent job against him in general. Um, it hasn't necessarily resulted in victories, that's for sure. But it may be that they just say, all right, well, we'll adjust wherever he goes. You know, we'll adjust, we'll play some zone, or we'll figure out a way to, um, you know, double him and see what happens. You know, it may just be that following – having Alexander follow him gets a little too complicated. That's, that's something I want to see. You know, if they do do that, I expect the lions to move him all over the place. It's worth mentioning too. It's worth mentioning too. Remember last season, Jared Goff went the last nine games without throwing an interception. The last person to have an interception on Jared Goff last season was Jair Alexander. So that's another reason to, you know, and it was kind of one of those where you, you kind of play back in zone and, and the ball kind of floated to him, but he, he can take the ball away. You know, it's, yeah, it's, it's awfully important. Because of that, do you see this? I mean, when Jair Alexander's on the field, it seems to me like they play a little bit more mixed coverages because Jair likes to play man. Rasul likes to play zone. Um, do you see them maybe going more to just strictly zone to try to get some interceptions or against this offense, against these receivers, should do you need to play just man? Or is that something that – Well, you, you don't know? want to be caught in man on on St. Brown a ton. Uh, you're, you're asking for some trouble there if you're continually covering him in man and not giving any help. I think you just have to mix it up. That's what Joe Barry does. That's the – that's the genesis, uh, you know, of his offense is uh, defense is uh, um, mix it up. Never let them know for sure what you're in. You know, sometimes you're half zone, sometimes you're half zone man, or you know, all zone or all man. You know, just switching it up consistently. And I think that is what they have to do. Try not to let the Lions dictate to them, you know, what defense they're playing play your defense and adjust to, you know, having to cover St. Brown. But with that being said, let's go ahead and move back to the safeties. Um, guys, after the Atlanta game when Darnell Savage had, or I'm sorry, after the Chicago game when Darnell Savage had 10 tackles, although I think they took a tackle away from him. So nine, um, he made the joke, your body feels it after that. I don't like doing that every game. Of course, if, you know, you would think if if you have to, you do it anyways. But then we saw versus the Falcons that, you know, he kind of played back a little bit, tried to play more in coverage and against a run game that, that, that ran all over them. In the Saints game, it felt like almost at midway through the second quarter, he kind of flipped that switch again and was like, 
okay, I've got to come up into the box a lot. I've, I'm going to have to play in this run game. Do you do, do you need Darnell Savage to be your leading tackler for this defense to be successful is, is what I'm getting at. I, I he, think he's second on the team again after the Saints game. I think he's playing pretty well through three games. I mean, he's not making every play. And, and if we know anything about Darnell Savage, that he loves turnover plays. But I think he's doing a good job of, of playing his assignment. You know, he's got two tackles for loss in three games. That's that's pretty good for a safety. Uh, he's got the speed to be all over the field at once, but it, it doesn't matter if, if he works outside the framework of the defense. That's that's all. That was the bugaboo last season that got him benched. Uh, I you know he's he's missed a couple tackles, but I, I think he's playing solid. He's playing a lot better than he did last year. Yeah, I think I think he's doing what they need him to do. He's making he's coming up and making some pretty nice tackles. He had a really clutch tackle on that last drive. Yeah, he did uh, in the flat. You know that that was that was the kind of tackle that. Darnell Savage missed last year and you know it would have been a first down and they would have kept driving and instead you know he forces a longer field goal and they miss it so that was a pretty big play I I'm not sure I think week to week it'll depend week to week you know they gotta they gotta cover um Sam Laporta their um rookie tight end who is really dangerous I mean he's he's um you know, doing what Luke Musgrave, you know, they hope the Packers hope Luke Musgrave can do on a consistent basis. He's doing it right now. And so they've got to, um, you know, they may need Savage back to, to defend that. I don't know. It's, I think week to week, it's going to be different, but right now, just, if you're darn on Savage, just keep doing what you're doing. Don't, try to do anything else because it's really helping their defense when he plays like that. <laughs> he always jokes every time that the media comes to talk to him when he's done, he's like, okay, that's my last time I'm done for the year. And when we went up to him Sunday after the game, I was like, I said, Darnell, you got a minute. And he was like, again. And I said, this is your fault. If you don't play good, then we don't come talk to you. I said, you either play, if you play crappy or play good, we're going to come talk to you. Just play mediocre and you can avoid us. So I was like, so really this is your fault. Um, but yeah, to, to both of y'all's points, stepping it up so far. Rudy Ford, after the first couple of weeks, you know, we thought, should they bench him? Should they try somebody else? Has he done enough versus the Saints? And, and when you look at what he could do against this Lions team to keep him in there for at least a little bit longer. I'll be short on this and Spoon, if you want to expound, be my guest. They don't have anyone else. It's just... <laughs> Who else are they going to play? And I'm not saying that he's been Drek, but he is what he is. They, they don't have anyone else. I think I think he's played solidly. I really do. I do, do think he gives them a little um, a dimension of physicality in, back there. He is a good hitter. Um, sometimes you can get away with that. I mean, the Packers won a Super Bowl, and not to um, – downgrade him but charlie pepra was their starting safety and he was just solid just a solid player who didn't make mistakes and if rudy ford can be that then he can be the starter all year they just he just can't miss tackles and he he can't blow assignments and so far that really hasn't been the case mm -hmm. so he, he's given them enough at this point <laughs> enough that's all you can ask for in some cases um, while we're kind of talking about safeties, both of these guys play on special teams. Darnell Savage made a huge tackle on special teams versus the Saints to, to pin them deep in their own territory. Um, but we also saw on Sunday versus the Saints, the they went from Jaden Reed to Keyshawn Nixon on punt return. Rich Passaccia, when asked about it on Monday, kind of said, well, you know, Jaden had been playing a lot of snaps, which is true. He had been playing a lot of snaps. So had Keyshawn Nixon. Spoon, do, do you expect to maybe see these two start to rotate at that position on punt return starting tomorrow night? Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think Basacha said they just were looking for a spark um, from Keyshawn Nixon. And maybe, you know, he's not getting very many opportunities on kick returns. Yeah. So 
maybe that's just a way to get the ball in his hands. And, you know, Jaden Reed's playing more and more snaps. I, I think it's it'll be dependent on the situation. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if Reed is back doing it Thursday night, and then maybe they bring in Nixon later. I don't know. Uh, I don't think – I still think Jaden Reed is going to be a really good punt returner, if not um, already. But uh, once in a while, yeah, you, you, Keyshawn Nixon can provide you with a huge spark. And when you're down 17 points, I mean, that's what you're looking for is a spark. And I think that's why they made that move. He certainly is a spark, and you do just need to get the ball in his hands. We saw them do that versus the Saints on offense with a play, where a jet sweep, and he picked up 11 yards, just bada bing, bada boom. Ryan, I know you talked to him about that this week. Um, what are the probabilities that we continue to see Keyshawn Nixon in other phases of the game? Well, first of all, I'm still trying to figure out what team I'm I'm covering where the, the, the Packers have depth at returner. I, that I can't remember that ever being that I mean, so many years they just and, and I'm not even just talking Amari Rogers so so many years they, they've just needed a returner somebody please return this in a competent fashion and they actually have depth they have options for multiple positive returners back there that that's new uh, but as a whole, I think that the Packers the coaching staff, Matt LaFleur is just trying to get find ways to get the football in Keyshawn Nixon's hands because kickoff return right now is not – that when when teams see, okay, he's an all-pro, he, he returned half a season, and he led the league in return yards as a kickoff returner last year, he's not getting kicked to. And that's, you know, when the weather turns bad, it, it might be more difficult to avoid him. But week four – it's not difficult to avoid them when it comes to kickoffs. And we've seen that through three games. So whatever ways that they can get the ball to Keyshawn Nixon, I think a, a real, a real big question coming into this game is whether or not that one play he got on offense is going to continue or not. How often, how frequently we're going to see that as the weeks continue to, to pile up. Uh, but I do think that they're very interested in trying to find ways to get the ball to Keyshawn Nixon. And why wouldn't you be? He's an all pro for a reason last year. Yeah, you can see him just itching on kickoff return, and he you can almost like see him deflate whenever the ball is kicked over his head or away from him because he wants it in his hand. I want to see Keyshawn Dixon throw a pass. I think he could do it. I don't know if they do. <laughs> I don't be know if they want to see and, uh, Manuel Wilson. <laughs> no. I, that's the other thing I'm still trying to figure out is how was Emmanuel Wilson that got called to throw that you know, if if he th if he delivered a strike, then be like okay. But given the situation, fourth down, um, we've said all there is to be said about AJ Dillon. He has not been productive as a runner, but he is a veteran. He's played a lot of football. I can't imagine his his lateral would have been any worse than Emmanuel Wilson's. Um, that, that, I'm still scratching my head over that one. I'm, I'm surprised they didn't um, use Jaden Reed because they had. They had lined up Dobbs and Reed in the backfield a couple times, and it might have been um, more interesting to see. It might have been a better choice to have someone like Reed or Dobbs, you know, toss it to them and then go back. I mean, it would have I, – I don't think it raised any flags because they had already been using those two guys right. out of the backfield. And it feels Anyone like else. Anyone else. I swear every NFL tight end played quarterback at some point in his life. Why not use a tight end? Anyone yeah. else? Yeah. And, and you know, I'm, this, well, this can be a quick little aside. I've heard a lot of debate this week about that play and about that play call in that situation. I don't think it was a bad play call. Like, and you want to be aggressive early on, you're on, you're, you're on the opposite side of the field. I don't hate the play call there. I mean, Hate the execution, not the call. Yeah, yeah. Spoon, did you were you okay with the call itself? Yeah, yeah. I thought it was a good call. I mean, it certainly started that way. Now, the one thing that was a little bit, um, you know, what didn't they didn't take into account was that Marcus Lattimore played it perfectly. He, unlike you know Jair Alexander, in that. Um, the Falcons flea flicker, he kept running with Dobbs. 
it wasn't until Jordan Love fumbled that he, you know, dropped Dobbs and or was it Dobbs or Wicks? I can't remember. It was Wicks. It was Wicks, it was Wicks. Um, that he dropped them and then you know started going after Love, but he smartly played it like I'm not going to leave this guy until I know for sure that it's a run, yeah. and um, you know that that was the ill-conceived portion, but. The, you know, the fact that the ball squirted through Love's legs, you know, sort of got Wicks open. So I don't know what to think about it. You know, now I still think it's a decent call, but, you know, who knows? It was so screwed up that way. Decently athletic play for my Jordan Love to still get the ball and, and try to get it off. I don't know if you – uh, well, what did you, say? you asked him about baseball and he said he played in Little League. Uh, yeah. so, I mean, maybe if he played high school baseball, he could have picked that one up. <laughs> Figured out how to ground it a little bit better. Yeah. Get into that stance. Well, yeah, dig it out, you know. Yeah. Something he did do well, and, and we're just kind of going down a little rabbit hole here now, but something he did do well. I went back and watched the game after we did the podcast on Sunday. He had a, a fake handoff where he hid the ball and then rolled left and he hit Wicks down in the flat. And guys, it, it looked almost identical to Aaron Rodgers. And I know we don't want to continue to compare, but those are the little things where you look at and go, he was paying attention the past three years. He was you learning some looking, stuff. You know what's looking like Aaron Rodgers? Seven touchdowns and one interception. Now it's early. It's small sample size alert. But he is really taking care of the football, and that's not nothing because let's remember that his final college season at Utah State, the guy threw 17 picks. So that was something you wondered about Jordan Love coming into the league. He threw a lot of interceptions in his final college season. Seven touchdowns and one pick, pretty good. That, that's yeah. pretty good for, for the first three starts as a full-time starter. Yeah. Uh, well, we will see what he can do on Thursday against the Lions. Guys, I'm going to actually give you a question for your final 60 seconds here today. I'm not letting you go off on whatever you want to. I'm giving you something here. I asked the guys in the locker room this yesterday, and they had some fun with it. We saw Taylor Swift at the Chiefs game over the weekend, and uh, Travis Kelsey basically said, you know, I shot my shot, and it worked out. She came. If you could shoot your shot, and invite any celebrity, it doesn't have to be for a date, any celebrity to come to a game or to come to your place of work, who would it be? Spoon, I'll let you take that one first. To what, Spoon? I said, Ryan, you go ahead and take that <laughs> Y'all both told me. <laughs> I am yielding the floor to seniority, and uh, I dare not let – let my my elder senior go go last on this. I don't part. know who I would invite. I might would invite Taylor Swift. I'm taking Scarlett Johansson. Sorry, Scarlett Colin. Johansson. Sorry, Colin. It's it doesn't just, have to be know. for a date. It can just be any celebrity that you would like to spend the day with and to come to your place of work. Scarlett Johansson. Okay. Uh, I would require the um, Talking Heads to make a reunion. Um, and then play a concert after the game. That the would be my. Heads. Yeah, I knew you wouldn't know who that was. I don't know who that is. The Talking Heads. You don't I know who the Talking Heads are? Oh my! I'm not proud of myself right now. No. Oh my God! Get me off this podcast right <laughs> can now. Can you sing a song for me? Can, can, can you give me can a few lyrics here? Burning down the house. Ever oh. heard of that song? Yeah, I know that song. Burning I, I think I need you to sing it for me. I'm really disappointed. Even one of their members is from Wisconsin. So really? I do you know, know this. Song I'm disappointed, me too. I'm disappointed. Oh. Too. Yeah. Oh, you could have like Billy Joel and Elton John do their reunion tour again. That would oh. be cool because I wanted to see that. Was that a sigh of derision or agreement, Spoon? That was derision. <laughs> I, although I do like Billy Joel is a hell of a piano player. I, yeah. I'll give him that. He was fun at Lambeau Field a couple years ago now. That would have been cool. Being Piano Man in Lambeau Field, that was a neat experience. He and Elton John years ago did a Dueling Pianos tour together. And my dad and I wanted to go so bad, but the tickets were so expensive. 
And looking back, we both are like, why didn't we just spend the money? Why didn't we just go? That would have been such a cool concert to see. But alas. Okay. Well, those are our picks for the celebrities to show up at the next Packers game. They're just going to sit in the press box behind us and watch us work. And, and it'll be exciting for all. I can tell. Uh, you know, I'd also like to see Run DMC come to a game once, too. <laughs> That's, I never would have thought you would say Run DMC. What's going on? I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm an... I'm a child of the '80s, so you know there's some there's some others I could think of too. Just give I'll, me a little... I'll, I'll give you this story. So, you know, it, it comes with the job for all of us. We don't get starstruck. We, you know, we we talk to celebrities for a living. This is what we do. The one time I've ever actually been starstruck on this job is in the press box uh, before kickoff of the 2014. NFC Championship game. And if you know Seattle, you know, they, they do it right. They know their brand. There's a Starbucks little station there. And so I, I get my Starbucks and I turn back to my seat. There's this man in a leather jacket walking this way. And it's Eddie Vedder. Eddie Vedder walks right past me. And I, I kid you not, I <laughs> damn near fell down. I, that was, that was, oh my God, that's Eddie Vedder. Uh, that, that, yeah, that's the one time I've been starstruck. So, yeah, hanging out with Eddie Vedder would be pretty cool, too. That would be cool. That's a better story than me riding down an elevator with Ben Stein. You guys probably don't know who Ben Stein is. I know who Ben Stein is, okay? Yeah. I, I know Ben Stein. I don't know talking heads, but I know Ben Stein. Yeah, yeah. Win Ben Stein's money. Boy, that was a big moment for me to be in the same elevator with him. <laughs> I saw after the Falcons game that Niall Horn was there, which I y'all probably don't know who Niall Horn is. But I was like, I'm glad I didn't see this during the game that he was there because there's a thousand percent chance I would have been out of that press box and in the stands looking for him. Um, he's a singer. So that would have been pretty cool too. Okay. Well, that's been see, that was a fun little conversation to end on. Uh, we will be at Lambeau Field on Thursday night to cover Packers versus Lions. Um and an interesting matchup early on in the season to gain control of the NFC North, whoever wins this game. Uh, we will have full coverage for you. Spoon will have his live blog going starting an hour and or starting half an hour before the game. Yes. And then an hour and a half before the game, we will get inactives, a very, very important inactives list to pay attention to tomorrow. Ryan will have that story for you. And then we'll have full coverage for you during and after the game as well. Guys, thanks so much as always. This has been the Green 19 podcast from JS Online and PackersNews.com.